Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get started here. Thank you all for coming and welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. Uh, please take just one moment to make sure that your cell phone and other electronic devices are in silent mode. Um, thank you. Um, a word of introduction, my name is Ryan Anderson and I'm a research fellow here at the Heritage Foundation and I'm uh, delighted to be able to host uh, today's event. In 2007, Boston Children's Hospital became, as its website brags, quote, the first major program in the United States to focus on transgender children and adolescents. Today, uh, just a little more than a decade later, over 45 pediatric gender clinics have opened their doors to our nation's children. Parents are told that puberty-blocking drugs and cross-sex hormones may be the only way to prevent their children from committing suicide. Never mind that the best studies show that somewhere between 80 and 95% of children who express a discordant gender identity will come to identify with their bodily sex if natural development is not interfered with. Never mind that 41% of adults who identify as transgender attempt suicide at some point in their lives. Never mind that people who have had sex reassignment surgery are 19 times more likely than the average population to die by suicide. These statistics are tragic, and they should stop us in our tracks. They should be more than enough to halt the headlong rush into transitioning and prompt us to find more effective ways to prevent these tragic outcomes. Most of all, we shouldn't be encouraging children to transition or making heroes and role models out of those who have done so. And yet, when it comes to treating young people who believe they are the opposite sex, physicians have been instructed by their professional associations to provide transgender affirmative care. And just earlier this month, a bill was introduced in the House of Representatives that would elevate gender identity to a protected class in our federal civil rights law. This Orwellian titled bill, the Equality Act, would deny parents and physicians the freedom and equality to seek out and practice good medicine. It would prevent physicians nationwide from treating gender dysphoria according to their best medical judgments. And even a referral to another doctor could be a violation of the Equality Act. Transition affirming therapies are virtually untested and inflict lasting harms. And instead of providing parents with medical information and evidence-based studies, parents are frequently pressured into accepting these risky treatments on behalf of their children, frequently blurring the line between informed consent and coercion. And so it's essential that we start a conversation about these risky hormonal treatments and irreversible surgical interventions. And so today we've assembled an expert panel to discuss the medical risks associated with these therapies, the ideology that's driving this scientific experiment, and the need for increased transparency in the medical community. So now uh, allow me to introduce the panelists. I'll introduce them in the order in which uh, they will speak. Uh, first, we'll hear from Elaine. Elaine is the mother of a gender dysphoric daughter uh, who recently uh, underwent uh, life-altering medical interventions. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Michael Laidlaw. Michael is an endocrinologist practicing in Rockland, California. He graduated from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in 2001 and has been practicing medicine for the past 18 years. Third, we'll hear from Dr. Marion Rutigliano. She's an emergency medicine specialist here in Washington, D.C., has been practicing medicine for 31 years. She graduated from New York College of Osteopathic Medicine back in 1988, specializes in emergency medicine and internal medicine, and she currently works evaluating research on the human health effects of toxic chemicals. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Walt Heyer. Uh, Walt is an author, a public speaker, uh, who formerly identified as and lived as transgender. He's the author of several books, and through his website, sexchangeregret.com, he helps uh, individuals who have transitioned, uh, detransitioned, and reclaim uh, their original identity. One word of caution, uh, today's discussion will be disturbing to many of you. Uh, it will be disturbing because what's being done to the bodies of young people today is shocking. Uh, there will be some sensitive images shown on the TV monitors, uh, PowerPoint presentations that will show what normal pubertal development looks like, and then what puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgical interventions do to interfere with normal development. So please just be aware of some of those images. 
And now please join me in welcoming today's panel. <clears throat> I am a mother whose daughter has identified as transgender since the age of 14. I am here today because I love her and because I care deeply about her and other kids who identify as transgender. These are young people, like my daughter, who are in turmoil and who are not getting the compassionate care that they need and deserve. I am going to explain to you what happens when parents seek out expert advice to help their transgender identifying children explore their feelings and discomfort with their sex. What is affirmative care? The, the current standard of treatment pr promoted by medical and psychological associations is called affirmative care. While this sounds nice, affirmative care leads directly to putting children on the path to medical transition with little chance of turning back. Let me explain to you how this works. If you take your child to a clinic to seek help, affirmative care means the therapist must follow the child's lead. The professionals must accept a child's gender identity. In fact, this is the law in many states. Under conversion therapy bans, questioning a child's gender identity is now illegal. So if a little boy is five years old and believes he is the opposite sex, affirmative care means going along with his beliefs. <laughs> Parents are encouraged to refer to him as their daughter and let him choose a feminine name. Teachers are told to let him use the girl's bathroom at school. Therapists will reassure parents that social transition is harmless and reversible. Is it really harmless to tell a child who still believes in the tooth fairy that he is the opposite sex? Isn't it quite likely that this child is just confused? If a 10-year-old girl is uncomfortable with her developing body and suddenly insists she is a boy, affirmative care means blocking this girl's puberty with powerful drugs. Doctors will tell parents this is a perfectly safe and reversible way for her to explore her gender. Affirmative care does not help this child get to the cause of her discomfort. Medicating her with these drugs is not safe. In fact, her future fertility, sexual functioning, and bone development may be negatively impacted. Once the teenage years begin, affirmative care means giving young people cross-sex hormones. Girls as young as 12 are prescribed testosterone for lifetime usage, while boys are given estrogen. These are serious horm hormonal treatments that impact brain development, cardiovascular health, and may increase the risk of cancer. There are no long-term studies to prove this is necessary, safe, or prudent, while there are many known hazards to using these same hormones when medically treating adults. What does affirmative care look like? This is what is called gender-affirming top surgery, also known as a double mastectomy. They are performed on girls as young as 13 years old, otherwise healthy girls who believe they are transgender. This is a picture of a woman's arm after the skin and other tissue was removed to fashion a fake penis. Jazz Jennings is an example of affirmative care. Jazz was born a boy, but raised as a girl since the age of five. He was treated hormonally since age 11. Last year, at the age of 17, Jazz had surgery to remove his penis and create a simulated vagina out of his stomach lining. After surgery, Jazz's wounds began separating and a blood blister began to form. An emergency surgery was performed. According to Jazz's doctor, as I was getting her on the bed, I heard something go pop. <laughs> When I looked, the whole thing had split open. This is a picture of Jazz's face in pain from these surgical complications. This is a medical experiment on a child that has been playing out on television for the past 12 years. No one knows what might happen next. There are teenage girls undergoing radical hysterectomies in the name of gender identity. 
It is not acceptable for doctors to remove healthy limbs from children, so why is it acceptable for doctors to remove healthy reproductive organs from children? I am here today not just because I care about children who identify as transgender, but because I also care about their parents and other family members. Parents are doing everything they can to help their kids lead healthy, happy, and fulfilling lives. Yet when parents seek out experts for help, they receive a one-size-fits-all narrative that has no basis in science, common sense, or compassion. The experts tell parents that it is harmful to question their children's beliefs, that they must support their children's medical transition, which includes a lifetime dependence on hormones, and that if parents do not comply, their children will be at higher risk of suicide. These parents are being lied to as their children are harmed and their families are torn apart. Why not help children learn to love the bodies in which they were born? Isn't that what the body positivity movement is all about? I traveled across the country today to speak here to make a difference. I hope that my trip was not in vain. Transgender identifying children need our compassion and they need our help. They need responsible adults to gently question their beliefs, not blindly affirm them. They need proper therapy and guidance, not drugs and surgeries. And the medical practices that are abusing them need to be shut down. Please speak out for these children. As I stated in the beginning, I am speaking out because I love my daughter. And it is because of her that I know what I have told you today is true. She has been a victim of gender-affirming medical procedures, and I was powerless to stop doctors from harming her. Someday, I hope she will realize that I am advocating for her health and for her future. She has incredible courage, strength, and tenacity, as do many transgender-identifying youth. We, as parents of these young people, advocate for our children because we love them. Many of us are going through unimaginable grief because we love them. We are standing together and we will never back down because we love them. We parents have formed our own support groups and a new coalition, the Kelsey Coalition, to help spread this message and change the systems that failed our children. Will you please stand with us? Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Heritage Foundation. Could we get the PowerPoint back up? OK, thank you. Um, I'd like to start with some scenarios first. Uh, and you've heard one of them already. A 17-year-old boy has the penis of a 9-year-old. How does that happen? Girls in the United States as young as 13 and 14 years old are having mastectomies of completely healthy breasts. Why is this happening? NIH-funded research is examining the effects of, of, of kids as young as age 8 receiving injections for gender transition. Who is allowing this? Step back, uh, talk about some definitions. What is gender dysphoria? It's a mismatch between a person's physical sex and their mind's perception of that sex. It leads to significant distress uh, and clinically impairment of functioning lasting at least six months. And this is a real condition, and, and these kids, of course, deserve all the care and attention and love in the world. But we're concerned about medicalization. Most of these kids, uh, as Ryan said, will, will actually grow out of this condition either through watching and waiting or help from a therapist or psychologist. There's a newer phenomenon of uh, adolescents, uh, particularly uh, teenage girls and some boys who are suddenly developing this condition. Uh, Dr. Lisa Littman did an excellent uh, publication about this. And there seems to be involvement. Many of them have uh, neuropsychiatric conditions or uh, say autism, um, social media and YouTube and things like that. Binge watching YouTube videos of transitioners seem to be playing a role. Uh, contagion seems to be playing a role. 
The opposite of allowing kids to grow out of this or helping them uh, with therapists is gender affirmative therapy, and uh, Aileen went, went through that, but basically a social transition, puberty blockers, which I'll talk about, cross-sex hormones uh, or opposite sex hormones, and then surgical modifications. This, what is all this predicated on? Something called uh, gender identity. Uh, and this was defined in a court case uh, as a person's core internal sense of their own gender. What's interesting I found in this case is they said that this gender identity is the primary factor in determining a person's sex. This is an ongoing case and not biology. That's incorrect. Um, colleagues uh, and myself wrote a letter to our main uh, endocrine society's journal with concerns about this therapy, but also the diagnosis. Let's think about it for a minute. If your child or someone you knew had cancer, would you want a pathology result? Would you want imaging to prove the cancer before you give harmful chemotherapeutics? How about this? How about for the so-called transgender child, the, the gender identity? Can you find it in a blood test? Can you do uh, testings of genetics? Or can you do a brain image and find the gender identity in there? You cannot. There is no objective test to diagnose this. Yet, we're giving very harmful therapies on the basis of no objective diagnosis. This might seem obvious if you can see the slide. There are only two sexes. Uh, certain science publications are, want to make you think there's more or that it's a spectrum. You can prove this to yourself through a thought experiment. Start with yourself as a fertilized ovum and work your, well, work your way backwards. You'll find a sperm coming from a male and an egg coming from a female. And this is true of 100% of cases now and forever in the past and forever more. Sex is identified at birth. Uh, nobody assigns it. Doctors don't arbitrarily assign this person to be a boy and this person to be a girl. Uh, and we all know how to identify it. I would say ask someone's grandmother who doesn't read these science periodicals and they'll tell you exactly how to identify boys from girls. Now, there are, we divide uh, sexual development into stages we call Tanner stages. And you see at the top there, Tanner stage one, the male is on the left, female on the right. One is uh, undeveloped before puberty. Five is full uh, adult development. Two is the beginnings of puberty. So a pediatrician could recognize this through beginnings of pubic hair, as you can see, uh, length, beginning to lengthen the penis, testicles, breast development in females. Later on, around stage four is where fertility is established, first period in females, uh, sperm development, usually four, sometimes three. But th those are important uh, times to keep in mind. What governs this whole system is the endocrine system. Uh, there's a small gland that's at the top there called the pituitary gland, hangs off the brain, produces hormones, signaling hormones. Uh, you can see LH, FSH. These act on the gonads. So in the male, LH will act on uh, the testicle to produce testosterone, you can see illustrated there. And uh, in the female, LH will act on the ovaries to make estrogen. And it's these hormones which take the person through the stages of development and then uh, are available in adulthood. Now, there are medical conditions where this process is interrupted. We call it hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is something an endocrinologist uh, would diagnose and treat. Um, there are also hormones which can cause, uh, cause this to happen. Uh, medications like Lupron you may have heard of. This is used for prostate cancer. It works in this way to stop the pituitary from making this LH um, and lowering testosterone and preventing uh, growth and spread of uh, prostate cancer. It's also used uh, in uh, early puberty. There's something called precocious puberty. This might start at, say, state, uh, at age four. And so doctors can use this type of medication to delay it to a more appropriate age, like age 10. What about using this medication for stopping normal puberty, say at 12 or eight? This is an off-label, untested, experimental use. It hasn't been through any FDA approval process. It's what, what I would call a chemical conversion therapy. You can see here illustrated um, the, our endocrine society is recommending for these kids to stop puberty at Tanner stage two, which is just the very beginnings of puberty. And you can see they will not proceed through the other steps of puberty. This is what leads to infertility because they don't establish fertility. Um, other problems of sexual dysfunction on the I Am Jazz show, uh, Jazz says, I, I don't have any sexual sensation. I don't have any orgasm. This is because puberty was stopped 
uh, at this stage and never allowed to go forward. Okay, how young of an age are we talking about for puberty blockers? You can listen to here to uh, Ilana Scherer of UCSF Pediatrics. Um, as far as starting blockers, generally blockers are started at the first signs of puberty. Um, it often start, it can start like as early as like eight at times um, or nine. And so uh, those are kids who are going to be like in third or fourth grade. So in case you didn't hear, uh, eight or nine years old, third or fourth grade, and think of what you were doing at, or your kids at age eight, maybe building a snowman, maybe talking to snowmen, uh, maybe thinking you were a cat or a fairy, something like that. Do, do we really know that the girl thinks he's a boy? Is, is really that the case? Is this the appropriate time to be starting these medications? More side effects, I went through some of them. Uh, you're gonna disrupt the normal brain development that's happening with the sex-based hormones. Uh, it actually disrupts normal bone development because the sex hormones are important, so osteoporosis is a future risk. There are also neuropsychological effects. You can go yourself and look up the side effects of, say, Lupron. You'll see emotional ability, nervousness, anxiety, delusions. It even says monitor for development of worsening of psychiatric symptoms. Use with cautions in patients with a history of psychiatric illness. I've already said many of these adolescents have neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, Professor Michael Biggs at Oxford, uh, through Freedom of Information Act, uh, found out what was going on in their Tavistock clinic. Uh, children actually reported greater self-harm with this medication. Girls exhibited more behavioral and emotional problems, greater dissatisfaction with their bodies. Now you would think, if you had these side effects of these medications, wouldn't you want to stop? Well, eventually they do stop, but they found that the limited studies they have, 100% end up going on, up to 100% going on to cross-sex hormones, which is the next. So cross-sex hormones or opposite-sex hormones, which are really wrong-sex hormones, will be the next stage. So if a female would be given testosterone. Um, just to give you an idea how high these doses are, um, normal adult female will have a certain amount of testosterone, say in the range of 10 to 50. Uh, medical conditions can bring this up to 150 tumors, we make this as high as 1,000. They're recommending uh, to get these levels in the 300 to 1,000 range. This is some 10 to 40 times higher than the normal range. And are there side effects from this? Of, of course there are. Um, both sexes have shown uh, increased risk of uh, myocardial infarction, death due to cardiovascular disease. That's males taking this estrogen, females taking testosterone. Uh, with the male, five times increased risk of deadly blood clots, two times increased risk of stroke. Uh, females also been shown with liver dysfunction, hypertension, uh, potential for cancer of the ovaries or breast. I want to make this clear. There's no FDA approval for either of these medications for this use. And even at the UCSF pediatric site, um, it explains there, that's highlighted, that there is no FDA approval for this, but they're looking to get it through doing experiments. Here's another example. So the next stage is surgical conversion therapy. This is a female who had a, a mastectomy, and you can see the drain tubes there. People have said, you know, this, isn't this a, a male, Dr. Laidlaw? And we're looking at the male pattern uh, abdominal hair and the five o'clock shadow. These are the direct results of high-dose testosterone. This is from a publication Dr. Johanna Olson Kennedy is doing a five-year, $5.7 million uh, grant for research uh, to study these hormones. One of the publications shows mastectomies done on girls, and you can see there is a couple of 13-year-old girls having mastectomies of completely healthy breasts, 14, there's five, and so forth. Now, can a person of 13 or 14 consent do they know what really that they want breasts later on in life? Can they get them back again? Let's hear, hear what Dr. Olson Kennedy has to say about that. So what we do know is that adolescents actually have the capacity to make a reasoned, logical decision. And here's the other thing about chest surgery. If you want breasts at a later point in your life, you can go and get them. If you caught that, she said, if you want breasts later in life, you can just go and get them. Is that correct? Can you just get a new organ, um, mail order it, have surgeons put it in? You cannot. <sighs> 
Just another, uh, so for jazz, and the question, well, why, why were this sur complications of surgeries that Elaine talked about? Well, if you stop puberty at Tanner stage two, as you can see, the, the penis length is very small, so they can't use the full length of an adult penis to make the pseudo-vagina. On the right, it just shows a section of colon or large intestine being put into place to make this false vagina. So that's, that's why this is happening as a direct result of puberty blockers. So what's the bottom line on this uh, child-adolescent affirmative therapy? We, we don't know long-term outcomes. I've told you already some short-term problems, uh, but it hasn't been tested from childhood forward. Uh, medications are being used off-label without proper FDA risk assessment profile. The quality of evidence, if you look at the Endocrine Society's own guidelines on this for children and adolescents, it says right in there, it's low to very low quality evidence. This whole thing is an experiment on children. We're ignoring the voices of desisters and, and people who have, who have come out of this and recognized their, their sex. And the NIH is allowing unethical research to be conducted on children and adolescents, in my opinion. And so uh, myself and colleagues uh, use Freedom of Information Act to get more information about this research study, Johanna Olson Kennedy at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and found that in 2017, they actually lowered the minimum age for cross-sex wrong sex hormones. It was 13, they lowered it down to eight years old. So imagine giving eight-year-old girls testosterone. They're in third or fourth grade. This is unbelievable, but this is going on and you can see where I, where I pulled the reference. Now the question is, how young is too young? Before they were giving cross-sex hormones at 16, then it was 12, now it's eight. And I look at this as an endocrinologist and say, you know, there is another way to stop puberty if you don't want to use these medications. Just remove the testicles and the ovaries. You could do it at age four, for example. Remove, remove the gonads. Um, how could a four-year-old possibly consent to this? And I, and I was accused of, of you know, the slippery slope uh, when I said that. But this, well, we're already down the slope. We're already down the slope. And, and who's going to stop this? Who will speak up for these children? And uh, all of us need to speak up. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> all right. Um, All right, um, I'm gonna talk about um, what happens when you do speak up and what's happened to people who've spoken up. The first, um, the first firestorm really of, of um, someone, of a voice being suppressed, Michael Bailey wrote a book called uh, The Man Who Would Be Queen back in 2003. Um, the subtitle was The Science of Gender Bending and Transsexualism. Um, transgender used to be called transsexualism. And um, he, Bailey, uh, um, described the uh, work of uh, Ray Blanchard, who worked in the 1980s, who described two distinctly different types of transsexuals. One was homosexual men, and that's what most people think of when we think of transgender, is that these are, are gay men. Um, they uh, um, traditionally have been just dissatisfied with societal sex role stereotypes and expectations from men, and believing instead that they must really be women. Um, and in the past, they had support for that. Um, but Bailey um, noted that Blanchard also said that there are heterosexual men called autogynophilic. That was Blanchard's term. It was coined in 1989. Um, and it means men who are erotically obsessed with the image of themselves as women. Um, they, uh, are not, um, they are not women trapped in a man's body. Um, they have sexual arousal at the idea of themselves as women. And they now may be, uh, probably are the majority of transgender um, identified males. Um, they are really more men trapped in men's bodies, and Anne Lawrence, who is himself uh, a, a trans-identified man, wrote a book about that called Men, men Trapped in Men's Bodies, where he interviewed um, over 300 of these, of these guys. So the book would have gone, it probably would have been gone nowhere. It was nominated for a Lambda Literary Foundation Award, which it didn't get. It only sold a few thousand copies and probably would have gone nowhere were it not for the firestorm that erupted. Um, transgender activists said that the, um, the book was misleading, that it was false, um, and um, the, uh, what, what they did um, made it into a book written 
um, in 2015 by Alice Drager, who's a science historian called Galileo's Middle Finger. This was a book about scientific controversies and threats to a free press and free academic inquiry. And in Bailey's case, um, Drager writes that a small group tried to bury a politically challenging scientific theory by killing the messenger. So the, the firestorm that erupted wasn't really directed at Bailey's ideas, it was directed at Bailey. Um, Drager did essentially investigative reporting. She interviewed every single individual involved, every person that Bailey had in, interviewed in his book. She dug up original documents and she corroborated or debunked um, every claim. Ba the transgender activists who um, assailed Bailey um, accused him of abusing the rights of subjects, having sex with a subject, making up data. They accused him, he received threats and harassments via emails relentlessly. Pictures of his kids were posted online with sexualized captions. He was accused of sodomizing his own daughter. His academic colleagues were contacted and were told that Bailey was an alcoholic and they should encourage him to move. They accused him of practicing without a license and that he had no ethics oversight in his research. Um, Drager, who, was, who did a terrific job, identified an individual who set up really an enormous website um, hosted by a large state university for the purpose of taking down Bailey. Um, and she said that she figured out that what, what really had been done, that it wasn't his ideas, that it was essentially set up in an effort to shut him up about autogynephilia, um, one of the hallmarks of which is denying that you have it. Um, uh, ultimately, Bailey was um, pre pressured and pressured and pressured into stepping down from his department chairmanship at Northwestern University. Um, it, uh, it gets better. <laughs> Kenneth Zucker, this isn't his paper, but Kenneth Zucker in 2015 was um, head and had been head for um, decades um, of a clinic uh, in Toronto called the Child, Youth, and Family Gender Identity Clinic, or GIC, which was under the umbrella of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, or CAM. He, um, he was a researcher. He developed the DSM-5 criteria for gender dysphoria. He helped write standards of care guidelines for the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. He believed in helping kids um, feel comfortable in their own bodies. He believed that, that gender is malleable at young ages, and that gender dysphoria is likely to resolve with time. His approach is called watchful waiting, um, where you just kind of support the kids, watch them, help them through what are very, very difficult years, and discover, um, and there's, this is one of the things where there is good research on, discover that most of them just desist and decide not to transgender if left alone. However, um, he uh, was, um, because of this watchful waiting, um, his clinic had actually been closed in, uh, in 2014, they um, the, they said the waitlist the CAM said the waitlist was too long. Um, they laid off the only other full-time staff member, a psychologist, on the day she came back from maternity leave, um, and they continued activists continued to pressure um, the uh, center for, to uh, review um, Zucker's approach, which they did. And the review, which Zucker read, included a factual error, which the uh, which was not changed before the review was posted online. Um, there were interviews of only a few activists and clinicians who said that the clinic practiced conversion therapy. There were photos taken of patients and printed, posted without patient consent. Uh, former patients were interviewed who said they'd been traumatized by the clinic. And there was a false allegation by a, a former patient um, that Zucker had mocked his body. Zucker was essentially fired on the spot and his clinic was closed down. Um, over 500 of Zucker's colleagues signed a petition in his defense. In the fall of 2018, he finally received an apology for um, Cam for erroneously representing his behavior in words. The apology admitted that the report made false allegations and errors, yes, errors were made about Zucker, um, but the clinic stayed closed. We move on to 2017, and James Caspian at Bath Spa University in UK decided to do a, a master's degree. So he proposed a research project. He'd spoken with a surgeon who was getting more and more patients wanting their transition surgeries reversed. Um, those people who would like to go back are called detransitioners. And Bath Spa, the university, initially said, hey, that's great, let's do that. Um, we accept your proposal. But then Caspian discovered that um, a lot of people who detransitioned um, necessarily did not necessarily have surgery um, or um, wanted to detransition for uh, other reasons. Um, so he wanted to include all detransitioners. He was interested in the phenomenon as a whole. The university said, no, you can't do that because 
Attacks on social media may not be confined to the researcher, but may involve the university, and it might cause offense. Um, he ultimately, yeah, he ultimately went to court earlier this year, but unfortunately, uh, the case was brought too late. Um, so the court said, you know, we, we can't hear it. Um, but they did acknowledge that there was a, an issue of academic freedom of expression. Um, that, uh, oh, you can hardly read it, but um, Lisa Littman, uh, last, the end of last summer, published a paper originally titled Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Young Adults, a Study of Parental Reports. Within days of publication, um, trans activists pressured Brown University uh, to, that, the, um, uh, that the study was misleading because it said that there was a phenomenon, which she called rapid onset gender dysphoria, of kids spending tremendous amounts of times with each other online and in real life, but primarily online. I mean, these kids spend hours and hours and hours a day um, reading about trans, other kids being trans and about how to trans. And I encourage you, if you haven't done it, to go on I hate to say this, Tumblr, um, and other, other sites, and read what kids are, are saying to each other. Um, the uh, trans activists said, no, this isn't true. It's misleading. There are methodological errors. And within days, the university removed the press release about the paper from their website. And with continued pressure, the journal re-reviewed the paper, which is a really extraordinary thing to do. Um, not only did they re-review it, I mean, they got you know um, just senior editors, statisticians, academic editors. And what they found, lo and behold, that the results were identical. Um, but they did rename the paper, Parent Reports of Adolescents and Young Adults Perceived to Show Signs of a Rapid Onset of Gender Dysphoria. Um, the, uh, uh, um, Littman says that um, um, things were reframed, including the new title, um, but reframed mostly to emphasize that reports from parents have limitations, which was acknowledged in the original paper, and that rapid onset gender dysphoria is not a clinical diagnosis which was not claimed in the original paper, but rather a described phenomenon. Um, so that's Lisa Littman with her redone paper. Moving on. You have to wonder then, after this has been going on, um, why the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2016 allowed the uh, Human Rights Commission to take the lead in writing their guidelines for supporting and caring for transgender children. The lead author is a 25-year-old woman, a trans-identified female, um, who is not a physician, um, who um, essentially wrote and directed these uh, set of guidelines. There were 12 authors. There were only five physicians. Um, out of 66,000 pediatrician members of the American Association of Pediatrics, the input was really from less than 30 people. Um, it, and the uh, contributors on this, this original um, 2016 set of guidelines included um, one physician who was the director of a transgender, transgender health clinic at which 100% of the patients, the kids who came in, were considered appropriate for transition, 100%. Um, there was another physician who was uh, director of another gender clinic who says that um, self-identification as homosexual um, can be a normal first step for trans people. Uh, however, this uh, it was significantly revised um, in October of 2018. Now, this was written by physicians, but it was published to provide guidance for parents and clinicians through a gender-affirming approach. Watchful waiting was deemed unsupportive, and it stated that the mental health issues that kids have, because there are a tremendous um, number of associated comorbidities, comorbidities aside from autism, other psychiatric disorders, um, depression, a whole host of things, um, the uh, revision stated that mental health issues are really from stigma and negative experiences rather than being intrinsic to the child. And the, uh, the conflation or, or the confusion between um, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity is kind of exploited in conversion therapy pan bans. There are now conversion therapy bans in effect in 15 states. They were passed from August of 2013 to January of 2019. Until recently, it just meant using psychological techniques to try and change someone's sexual orientation from homosexual to heterosexual, um, although there is no reliable evidence that this is effective. Um, current conversion therapy bans are applicable to both sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so what do you do, especially when there's a director of a gender identity clinic saying, well, homosexual is just a step on the way to, to yeah, on just a step on the way to trans. 
Um, there are consistent um, reliable findings that um, gender nonconforming kids, you know, boys who prefer traditionally feminine um, uh, activities and girls who prefer climbing trees and playing with trucks, um, will often go on to become generally healthy gay and lesbian people as adults. Um, and will, that will happen significantly more um, um, than uh, them going on to be straight, although that does happen. So most kids who insist they are the opposite sex, if left alone, no longer have this belief or desire after puberty and with watchful waiting. Um, I would think that ultimately um, we would want kids to be comfortable with themselves and their bodies and that this is a priori, a better outcome than lifelong hormones with irreversible effects, irreversible surgeries, sterility, and struggling to believe the impossible, that they are the opposite sex, which can never happen. Um, and there is not a lot of data. There really are not a whole lot of studies. Um, what studies there are, this is, um, this is really a, a very good, um, you can find it online, you can Google it. This um, gentleman is a, uh, is a layman who, who gets it. The best studies show the worst outcomes. Um, given the sometimes heated debate around transgenderism in general and trans and kids in particular, and the toxicities of the drugs used and drastic body alterations of the surgeries, along with the irreversibility of both, I mean, one would expect that be, there'd be an explosion in research or a demand for research about um, what is gender dysphoria, really? I know there's a definition, but again, if you go to these online places, there are kids directing other kids, well, you have to say this. Um, here's what you say. This is how you get the medications. This is how you get them to give you the stuff. Um, and when they talk about their experiences, it's not the definition of gender dysphoria at all. Um, for many um, girls, it's um, great dissatisfaction with how they're treated as girls, being treated, being sexualized at very young ages by boys, grabbing them and calling them really awful things. Um, for the boys, um, some may be young um, uh, future gay men. Um, some of them may be uh, young autogynophilic um, males who will grow up to be autogynophilic men since the onset is at puberty. Um, so one would expect an explosion in research about what gender dysphoria really is, um, about the effect, efficacy of transitioning to relieve gender dysphoria. It doesn't work. Um, whether the risks of the medical and surgical interventions outweigh any benefits what are the long-term treatment effects? There's a concept called burden of treatment um, that, you know, when you're deciding, do I want to get treated for this, that, or the other, um, where there's a very low risk that the treatment will work, will I accept the burdens that this treatment um, uh, lays on me? And you would expect research about the ad adverse effects, and you would also expect that patients, parents, and physicians would want high-quality, objective research to answer really important questions about what's being treated, if it's effective for the underlying condition, and the risks, and does it work in the long term? Lay people get all that. Um, in studies of, uh, there, um, here we go. Um, the problem with most studies is that they are on trans kids is that they're cross sectional. They're just a one shot um, study which can tell you about incidents of, of certain phenomena, but doesn't tell you about long term effects, changes, or consequences. There are often controls that are lacking. There are no control subjects. And that if you do have a control subject, you really need control subjects that are the actual same sex as the, um, as the kid, the trans kid, and also of the sex of the sex that the kid thinks he's transing into. Um, there are confounding factors. The major confounding factor in kids, as we saw, is homosexuality, since if most of these kids were left alone, that's what would happen to them. Um, so, don't you want to know what percentage of kids would really go on to be same-sex attracted? Is there any difference between why kids want to trans if they're boys or girls, if they're um, lesbians or if they're straight girls or if they're bisexual, if they're boys who are autogynophilic, if they're boys who are homosexual, or if there are maybe a few boys who will turn out to be um, neither in neither of those categories? I would want to know about those things. Um, maybe those kids, probably those kids need to be treated differently. There are also, in most of the studies, very, very high rates of loss to follow up and very short study periods. Longer studies of patients who are followed up consistently show increasingly negative outcomes after a one to two year honeymoon period where people report, hey, everything is great. Starting at about five years and from five to 10 years, the rates of suicide start to go up dramatically. And this is supposedly after being well integrated into society as the supposed new sex. Um, the, uh, 
loss to follow-up isn't because those people are doing well. In studies of um, other medical and surgical conditions, patients lost to follow-up after treatment are generally found to have a, a fairly, a not insignificant at least, proportion of people um, who are doing poorly rather than well when you do track them down. So ultimately, um, as doctors, we really do want people to feel better. I mean, we do. That's You come in and we, we want you to feel better. Um, and we practice, we hope we practice, um, with an evidence-based practice based on what, what you know, studies are really telling us. Um, we hope it's based on high-quality research. And when you work with kids, you want to be an advocate for kids because, um, I mean, does, is there anyone in this room who doesn't remember some really dumb decision they made when they were 11 years old? I mean, <laughs> yeah, and even more so when you're, I think somebody said, you know, still believing in the tooth fairy. So you want to really advocate for kids um, and the best science for public policy and clinical decisions without cherry picking. You can't say, well, I like this science and I don't like this science because it does or doesn't support my preconceived beliefs. So you want the best science. Um, physician, you saw what happened to, you know, a lot of, um, you know, predom uh, prominent researchers who wrote books, um, how they were harassed. You can go online and see what happens to um, many women in particular who speak out, who get death and rape threats. Um, physicians themselves, you know, you fear loss of employment. Patient satisfaction surveys, believe it or not, are not so much measures of quality of care, but do measure how patients are satisfied about what they feel the diagnosis they were given is and what the treatment was. And I don't know if you know, but those are sometimes tied to continued employment. If you get too many not so good ones, and too many can sometimes even be two or three. Sometimes employment is uh, is terminated, um, or um, advances in pay are terminated. So um, there's a fear. Um, doctors don't want to get harassed. Um, doctors may not so much feel fear getting sued, but hospitals do. There's a case in the news right now of a, of a um, hospital that's refusing to uh, do a, perform a hysterectomy on a transidentified female um, who is uh, still an adolescent, I believe, and uh, the hospital looks to be possibly getting sued. Doctors are also overwhelmed keeping up with a new body of very flawed literature. Um, trans patients um, are, are um, uh, it's tough to deal with them. They require large amounts of usually uncompensated time. Um, the discussions are very difficult to have. Um, there is often conflict within families because it is it's so difficult and, and parents are, are sort of at a loss of what to, what to do. Um, and it is easier in many cases to acquiesce to providing medical and surgical solutions to social and psychological issues. Well, thank you, Ryan, uh, for putting this panel together. It's um, a topic that um, everybody brings a different perspective to. And if you haven't come to the conclusion yet, this is very complicated. And it has many different layers. And I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get to all of them. But we definitely need to open up a discussion about it. Uh, I, I lived eight years as a female named Laura Jensen after undergoing gender reassignment surgery in April of 1983. I started as a four-year-old kid in 1944. So I'm bringing to this conversation today 74 years of firsthand experience in some way, either living it or trying to deal with it or trying to recover from it. Um, and um, it's important, I think, to understand that Everything that we've heard today is damaging to children. And I was damaged by this, and I have some very strong points of view. Uh, so I hope that um, don't take exception to them. They come out of pain. They come out of real life experience. I'm not trying to be uh, hurtful to anybody, uh, but I think that uh, I have a website called sexchangeregret.com. And we get letters from either the parents or the transgenders themselves asking for help after they've lived the life like I did for 5, 6, 15, 18, 20, all the way up to 30 years. And they're saying, Walt, can you help me detransition? This was the biggest mistake of my life. I've met with people personally. We've had the honor and pleasure of working with people who are now detransitioning. Just recently, a school teacher, a pharmacist, and a good friend, uh, Jamie Shoup. I think it's important for us.
to realize that there is actually nothing good about affirming a young boy four years old like my grandma did me. The moment you affirm a child like my grandma did putting me in a purple chiffon dress and telling me how cute I was, how wonderful I looked, is the, at the very same moment that you're affirming that young person, you're telling them there's something wrong with them, that you're not right. That is child abuse. We need to begin calling it what it is. It's not affirming a child. It's causing them to be depressed and anxious about who they are. And then we go on to inject hormone blockers into them and begin altering their body. Can we begin to understand today from these discussions how destructive this is to the psyche? It's no wonder they end up with separation anxiety and bipolar disorder, dissociative disorders, schizophrenia, and many other disorders that they want you to ignore. They want to block any child from having access to psychotherapy. The only reason that I'm able to speak to you today is because after 46 years of dealing with this issue, I was able to detransition in 1990, after I had extensive psychotherapy, the very same psychotherapy that they're trying to prevent people from having. Why? Because they don't want them to detransition. Because somebody like me puts a real bad mark on the idea that it's all good, because it isn't. I've recently written a book, Trans Life Survivors, that has the stories in them. It's painful to get these emails from people whose lives have been totally torn apart. Men like myself who was married, had two children, had a career. I was an executive for American Honda Motor Company. One of those therapists who was an advocate for gender change surgery told me that what happened to you as a child wearing that purple dress, the only way to solve that is to have cross-gender hormones and undergo reassignment surgery. That's the solution. Well, I trusted his expertise because Dr. Walker had actually written the original international standards of care for treatment of gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria. I'm here because he was wrong. I'm here because those standards of care have morphed into what they're using today. They haven't changed much. Yeah, they've gone through revision after revision, but the basic idea is that when somebody comes in, they can self-diagnose their gender dysphoria. We are manufacturing transgender kids. We are manufacturing their depression, their anxiety, and it's turned into a huge industry that people are profiting from after kids' lives are completely torn apart. The most vulnerable people in our society and adults are tearing their lives apart. It's really beyond my understanding why we're even having this discussion because it shouldn't be happening. I don't believe any doctor who injects a young person with hormone blockers should have a license to do so. I would prefer that they not have that ability. And I hope that people began to realize this and began to speak up about it. There is absolutely nothing good about affirming somebody in a cross-gender identity because it destroys their life. We won't see the consequences of what they're doing today until 10 or 15 years later. And there'll be somebody else speaking up like I am, saying, 
It was horrible what they did to me. They never should have done it. The people are suffering. We're not trying to minimize their suffering. But why do we abuse them with hormone blockers and cut their bodies apart as a way to affect treatment? It's insane, actually. It doesn't make any sense if we're just to pause and take a sober breath it's insanity. When will we finally grasp this? Christina Olson, a research psychologist in Washington at Washington University, and I wrote the article is published in uh, Public Discourse in 2017 June. She said, "We do not know who the transgender kids are." One way or the other, we don't know who they are. Do you get that? We don't know who they are. Does that should sink in. They cannot actually identify who trans kids are except by them saying so. There is no test. There's no proof. A parent can actually cause a kid to be gender dysphoric by affirming them. The APA, which an article is going to come out in the Daily Signal in the next couple of days that I just finished last night, the APA in their handbook in 2014 says, kids are not born transgender. And yet, we're treating them with medical treatment as if they were and trying to alter them. They're not born that way. I want to say it again. We're manufacturing transgender kids. None of us should be a party to altering a kid's mind, his psyche, and sending them down the path where they're going to sit up here and say how their life was torn apart. And I, I'm the fortunate one. I got sober. I'm 33 years sober. I drank heavily and used cocaine as a way to try to mask the pain from having undergone the surgery as a way to cope with what grandma did in a purple dress that confused me. That when I was a little boy, four or five and six years old, I, I began to want to be affirmed. I began to enjoy being affirmed. I be became addicted to the affirmation and the attention. I mean, if a kid wants to steal all of the attention out of the room, all they have to do is say, I am a transgender. They can suck the life out of a room in a heartbeat. And the focus is right on them. And they can get anything they want, can't they? Nobody calls them out. Nobody says, how do you, how'd you come to this conclusion? Well, we know how they came to the conclusion. Schools are giving them books. They're indoctrinating them. Parents are encouraging them. Online, they're in chat rooms, suggesting groups of kids become transgender. It's a fad. Yes, there are people who are autogynophilia, but there's also people who are deeply troubled. Over 50% of the people that I've worked with, hundreds of people that I've worked with over the last 10 years, were sexually abused. Boys who are abused at a young age come to the conclusion that the only way they can prevent themselves from being sexually abused again is to cut off their genitalia and become females. In their mind, that is their defense mechanism for sexual abuse. Girls who are sexually abused want to be men as a way to fend off any intruder or sexual abuser because they will no longer be attractive for sexual abuse. Whether it's men or women, vast majority of them were abused as children. Many of them I sit with and talk with 
privately or in their 30s, 40s, and 50s before they're ever able for the first time to disclose they were sexually abused. It's too painful. I was sexually abused at nine years old multiple times by my uncle. When I told my parents I was sexually abused, they said, oh, Uncle Fred wouldn't do that. Wrong. They said I was a liar. So now I had worn a purple dress as a four-year-old. I had been sexually abused, and now I'm a liar. You know, it's not a real good way to start off life, and you're not only nine years old yet. We've got to start helping the young people. And when people ask for help from me, I have one simple thing I always ask them. Tell me what caused you to not want to be who you are. 100% of the time, they can tell me. They can tell me. I'm, I'm feeling the pain right now of them sharing with me some of these stories because even I weep. They're ugly. They're horrible. They're so deep, nobody wants to talk about it. But we better start talking about it. We're ruining an entire generation of young people. And it's serious business. I'm not pulling any punches anymore. And you shouldn't either. Thank you. So we're a little bit over time, unfortunately. Um, so we'll just do one or two questions, and then we're going to have to um, stop. So we'll go to uh, Brandon Showater from uh, the Christian Post. Hi, this is so powerful. Uh, question is, um, when you when I consider the fact that uh, we've got these for this is for doctors Lidlaw and Rutiliano, these NIH grants and all the stuff to study. Uh, these blockers, how is this being allowed within sort of the internal bowels of federal agencies that these studies get approved and the whole dropping the age from, you know, 13 to eight, like how, how does that e even happen? And do you all also know about, is the U.S. military, I'm just reading a report today saying like there's treating civilians with this transgender medicine through a U.S. military agency. And do you know anything about that? Is that also an avenue through which this whole transgender medicalization is now occurring? I don't know about the second, but on the first for the NIH question, um, that's what we're looking into. I don't know how the oversight works. I have no idea how this got past any committees. Uh, we've done freedom of information uh, requests uh, to get something as simple as consent forms, and we were not able to get them. So there's some sort of potential cover-up going on. Uh, there are Congress people who are looking potentially to investigate this. Do you know the other? The second, um, I, I don't know. I just have heard that, I mean, when dependents are treated, um, that if their kids are transgender, they can be, they can be treated with these, uh, with these uh, procedures, drugs, medications. Um, but I don't know anything about it as far as um, NIH and government agencies is the problem is, is that there's already a consensus that it's okay, which influences um, the review that institutional review boards make on whether or not um, a research study is is um, uh, is is okay. Um, so it's kind of like the the jury's already already decided. But but there are laws governing this. Th yeah, there are laws governing this. Um, but the laws have been broken. Yeah. Um, so I, I I'm not sure. Um, where that comes from, um, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Orr. I'm a Defense Security Service contractor here on my personal time, not on official agency business, obviously. I'm also a loyal Heritage donor since 2002 and a former Heritage intern way back in 1996. Uh, that long preamble aside, I guess this question is primarily directed toward Dr. Laidlaw and Dr. Rotigliano. I'll certainly welcome input from any of the panelists. You've talked in uh, graphic numbers about the high rates of suicide and other self-harm among transgender people. Is there any indication that th any of these gender dysphoric drugs, such as the uh, 
you know, such as the testosterone blockers, the hormone blockers, any indication that they're also causing violence toward other people, something along the lines of roid rage and therefore causing a public safety risk? The, the suicidality um, actually tends to occur. It's really, exa it's really exaggerated. The studies are poor, but the good studies that there are, um, it actually gets worse after transition. Um, not only suicidality, uh, suicidality increases, but things like psychiatric uh, hospitalizations. Um, and uh, there's also a, I mean, a significant number of comor comorbid diagnoses. Um, so the suicidality statistics are really um, misdirected sometimes and, and flawed. Not a lot of studies, and the good ones show that it's, it's really afterwards. Yeah, I'd just add to your other part. Um, in 2011, uh, there's a study done in Sweden uh, looking at the entire population because they track this with their government data set, um, males and females who've transitioned. And they found, if I remember, uh, females taking testosterone, their, their, their uh, criminality or being uh, incarcerated or, you know, for crimes actually ended up matching the males, something like that. So it went up and probably testosterone is a pro part of that potentially. Didn't change. Didn't change from males though. Um, men, yeah. men retained this. You know, men who, who supposedly transitioned to well, I can't really believe it. Transitioned to women um, maintained the same level of criminality as as other men who had not transitioned. Yeah, there's a study that came out in 2006, UK Guardian. Um, it was a huge research study program out of uh, Birmingham University that said uh, the title of the conclusion was sex change surgeries are not effective. And in the second or third paragraph of that report, it says people are traumatized to the point of suicide after undergoing reassignment surgery. The idea that changing genders is suicide prevention is absolute nonsense. So I don't know anyone um, who has spoken out uh, on this issue telling the truth that hasn't paid a personal price for it. Uh, and that's true for all four of our panelists today. These are uh, amazingly courageous people to be joining us today, uh, sharing with us their knowledge, speaking out publicly. Um, so please join me in thanking them.